Welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome once again to the Sports Pro Podcast. My name is Owen Connolly. I'm the editor at large at Sports Pro. Hope you're all doing very well indeed. It's great to have you all back. We have international sport in the UK this week. We have uh, an international cricket series which will already be underway by the time this podcast goes out, uh, weather permitting, between England and West Indies. Uh, We're going to be hearing a little bit later on the podcast from Steve Elworthy, the uh, Director of Events at the England and Wales Cricket Board, about the job of putting on international matches in the middle of a pandemic and creating biosecure environments and the like. And we're also going to be talking a little bit more widely about what the COVID-19 interruption has meant for the game of cricket with staff writer at the Daily Telegraph, who's also written for The Economist, 538, ESPN Crick Info, The New York Times, The New Statesman. He's the author of the Wisdom Cricket Book of the Year, Cricket 2.0, Inside the T20 Revolution. He's Tim Wigmore. Hi, Tim. Hi, Owen. Thanks for that kind introduction. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us. It's uh, ramping up for you, getting getting pretty busy as we start to see some of our first cricket anywhere in the world, if I'm not mistaken, since the Women's uh, T20 World Cup back in March. Yeah, no, it's it's obviously very nice to have international cricket back. We, we've had, um, actually, there's been some club cricket play throughout Europe the last month or so, so they're actually playing in Germany from the start of June, and we had to wait. We're, not, we're going to have to wait in the UK for another week um, for club cricket to return. But obviously, yeah, international cricket is a, a different beast. Um, so yeah, it'd be quite surreal to have it back. But I think everyone is looking forward to it. And um, yeah, it was a few weeks after the Premier League. It, it seems like a the time is right for for this to start now. Yeah, and we're going to obviously, as I said, hear from from Steve about the. What's what's gone into um, into getting the international game going? But that was recorded last week before we'd heard the news that that club cricket and uh, amateur cricket was going to return um, in the UK. Just you wrote a piece on the um, uh, on the protocols that that German clubs had put in place. So what what kind of things can we expect uh, where we don't have the kind of mass testing capacity and you know the the kind of the kind of painstakingly laid out wayfinding and uh, and and separation and all that kind of stuff. What what kind of things are amateur sports people doing to keep themselves safe? So yeah, in in, in the club game in in Germany, for example, a few you know, basic stuff like that. So obviously, you're not allowed to high five your teammates after after a wicket or whatever. Um, the umpire disinfects the ball after every over. There's, there's you know, very regular washing of, of hands and actually. In, in Germany, um, teams often don't have enough helmets between them, so they need to disinfect helmets. This is often only three, three or four per team, so they have to disinfect helmets between when, when players use them. Um, so we'll be, I think yeah, that sort of stuff in um, in grassroots cricket in England, you you know that it's it's sort of odd, but then you you, you get used to it. So another little one is you don't the fielder cannot be sort of uh, as you often get either fielder standing next to the square leg umpire, that's something you can't, you have to kind of adjust a little bit. So it's not, obviously none of this stuff is ideal, but it's, it's not insurmountable at all. I think, yeah, but cricket can make these adjustments kind of more painlessly than, than most grassroots sports, I think. Obviously the the hiatus of the last few months in, in what was going to be another pivotal year for cricket, not just uh, here in the UK, but internationally, we had two global tournaments, one of which we don't think is going to happen and we'll, we'll get onto that um, in a little while. But we came out of the Women's T20 World Cup into the kind of the bilateral swing. But since then, we've had no Indian Premier League, uh, no 100 here in England, which was going to be the um, the talking point of the summer. And coming off the back of, you know, the, the profile that cricket attained last year through England winning a, a World Cup on home soil, what have the priorities been uh, for the cricket authorities, for the ECB here and uh, ICC globally um, since they became aware that this crisis was descending? Well, obviously, the priorities are to, to keep the, the, the lights on, however best you know, the, the sport, sport can do that. Um, you have a, I mean, situation here, so most countries 
earn most of their money from ITC event, well, really a huge proportion of their money from the ITC, whereas the big countries earn less from the ITC. So um, sort of the smaller the country you are, the more important playing the World T20 is. But um, the sense actually is that if the, if the competition, which is going to be postponed for a year, uh, we think um, as long as that happens during the, uh, the broadcasting cycle, which runs till 2023, then as long as it runs within that cycle, it, things should be should be okay for financially for, in terms of uh, what countries receive from, from the ITC. And actually, because some of um, some of the minor countries received from the ITC is linked to kind of advertising and sponsorship the ITC, the ITC generates from its global events. Clearly, if the world economy was in a better place by the time it's, um, another event happened, the ITC would be in a better, in a better position to monetize it more and therefore... Um, to generate more money, which would pass back onto countries. Um, so, for, I mean, so for India, clearly the priority has been the Indian Premier League, um, which was, you know, due to due to start in April um, or the very end of March. Um, and obviously that, that did not happen. And now we're, we're looking at that probably being played. I mean, there's obviously still uncertainty, but we're probably looking at that being played from sort of the middle of, middle of September, which interestingly means we could be in a position to have well, we had four months out of eight given to the IPL, which is possibly a sign of, of cricket's cricket's future. Um, and certainly the, the growing importance, obviously, within the Indian market, but also the, the club game. Um, and, and I suppose most countries, they, you know, their priority is the most lucrative bilateral cricket that, that they can play. So actually for Australia, this the Austra- in the Australian summer coming up, uh, more important than the World 2020 um, is their home series with India. Um, which actually they can't all be able to happen. So, yeah, lot lots going on, and so as, as ever in international cricket, the the worry is teams will drop the games that aren't lucrative to them, which will hurt smaller countries. So we've seen Bangladesh already had four series have been postponed. Uh, Australia kind of on the quiet; they cancelled three ODIs only to play against Zimbabwe in August. So what what we could well see is you know with with the time having been taken out of the schedule, when cricket can resume, there's more pressure to play the most lucrative matches, and that sort of, you know, that means the sort of medium test nations, let alone the kind of lower and associate nations, they're sort of scrambling around um, for for matches against the, the most lucrative teams. What's that going to mean? Do we do we have any kind of medium range idea yet of what that will mean for the uh, the bilateral calendar? Yeah, so I, I did a piece um, for Telegraph on sort of how international cricket would be would be different um, because of, of COVID, and and it you know you could start with quite micro things. So tours, I think, will get shorter because obviously no one makes makes money from the the tour games and so on. So you know maybe you could trim even more of the sort of warm up games. You could they could they could be looking at reducing the size of touring parties so the way it is at the the host team they play they pay for the incoming tour, which means if the tourists send a squad of you know sixteen or seventeen players plus support of a scarf, that's getting into the, the mid twenties. Um, that's going to you know that costs a lot. So if you can shave a few off that, you can save a, a bit of money. Have short have shorter tours, probably less Test cricket because remember, I mean the the, the kind of key figure for Test cricket around the world, most Test matches not involving one of the, the the big three countries lose about half a million US dollars net. And that sort of simple fact points to, well, yeah, that shows how test cricket is, is in you know perpetual trouble, but it also, and it needs to be valued if it is to be valued in non-financial terms, but it also shows clearly when there's going to be a global recession, um, there will be big pressures on, on those matches. So I think, yeah, boards will prioritise the most lucrative fixtures that they can. I think, this would also increase with some administrators. It would also increase the appeal of four day matches simply because the fifth day, it, it's yeah, it's it's the most expensive bit of the operation of Test cricket. And and again, you get you get to a position where you can stage a three Test series in um, in eighteen days if, if it's you know three three four day matches potentially that they think, and that that just makes you know that costs a, that cuts a lot of flab. Um, but I think clearly, yeah. The club cricket will become more important, partly because travel is going to become, you know, it's going to become more difficult and more more expensive. You know, England had to, you know, getting a charter flight for the West Indies cost half a million. Um, so again, that's something that England can afford to do, given the worth of the Sky Deal for them. But smaller, you know, 
that sort of countries will not be able to to afford to do that. Um, so I think, yeah, boards will try and diversify and kind of be able to rely on more revenue um, that doesn't come from international cricket. And that, that was happening already. But again, I think we'll see COVID accelerate it. And I think unless there's a pretty radical steps to redistribute, redistribute money and cricket's historically obviously been very bad at this, then I think it's never for that financial inequality between countries will become even greater. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we're getting a bit of a flavour of what you might be talking about with uh, with the arrangements that ECB have had to make here. We've got uh, West Indies for the next couple of weeks. It's, it's barely even to the end of this month um, that they'll be playing games against England. Then we have Pakistan following uh, Ireland playing uh, a couple of limited overs games. There's still a hope that Australia will be able to make it over in September, October for some limited overs games. We have a, a tri-series for England's women against um, India and South Africa thrown in amongst all that as well. So truncated series, but uh, sorry, truncated calendar, but very much kind of accelerated um, series. You know, obviously, the I guess it's the same in every other sport where the priority has been honouring as much of the kind of most lucrative broadcast obligations as, as can be honoured. When is there going to be time to talk about the calendar? Because this is this has been kind of a headache for cricket going back decades, probably. But certainly every time a, a tournament gets added, you know, we, we talk about sacrifice being made somewhere or other to make things more coherent and, and a bit more equitable. And it never quite seems to happen. Um, are we going to see that conversation happen now in the next couple of years as we kind of head into new cycles? Or are we is this going to be just kind of punted down the field again? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no no sport is quite like cricket when it comes to the ability to kick the can down the road forever. And that's how you just get addition of, as you said, more and more cricket just kind of layered on top of each other, more and more leagues and stuff. And it's very hard to see where everything, where it all fits together. So we have a new global calendar from 2023 to 31, which was actually in the process of begun, begun to be discussed. Um, and yeah, and, and there are lots of issues in that in terms of where's the World Test Championship fit in, which was, was actually meant to start, or well, it started last year, it was meant to have a final next June in, at Lords. I think that's very, very unlikely now because so much has been postponed. We, we have a new ODI league, which is actually meant to uh, launch with England v Ireland series end of, end of July, which is meant to give context to one day cricket, which badly needs it. Um, there's also been you know, discussion about can you give proper context to T20 internationals? You know, it's a position where the most popular format of the game, uh, i.e. T20, is the only one in international cricket without a proper structure outside of the World Cup, which is kind of anomalous. Um, and then you have you have a real, you know, there's an appetite in India for the IPL to expand from 2023, which has be the new broadcasting deal, you know, talk of adding two more teams going from eight to 10 and adding at least two or three weeks, which again will add, you know, make it more congested. Uh, yeah, some administrators have, you know, have talked in support of the Champions League, which is a kind of competition for the best domestic teams for that returning. You've obviously got the 100 coming, which is now from next year. Um, so yeah, you add it all up and it's, it is, a, it is a mess and you need, you need a proper, I mean, yeah, you need administrators who can look beyond their very, very narrow short-term interest to, you know, what's the sport, how they want the sport to look like, you know, the end of this this decade. Um, and I think, I mean, there are plenty of ways that you you, you can do that. Um, you know, I would like to see kind of the, I suppose the ICC sort of empowered um, when it comes to test cricket and you could have, you say in the World Test Championship, maybe you carve out proper windows for it and you can even have, Ideally, probably a sort of centralised system of, of payment. So you say, this is almost like an ICC event. We're going to sell some portion of these rights um, in a central way. So you know, there's, there's been talk of pulling the overseas rights. Uh, and that way you, you get um, you get the product totally worth more. And you also, you also don't have teams who are relying on a tool from India that whole time. You can kind of, you, you flatten out the, the, the bump somewhat. If you do that, maybe, maybe you can pay more to international players from less well-off teams and, and that can help stop situation when you have lots of leading players from South Africa and West Indies probably especially who do not play international cricket which obviously weakens it um, but the kind of and the central probably broad trend in cricket is that cricket before T20 and before the IPL was unique probably amongst all major international sports in how little uh, 
of its revenue came from domestic, like club v club matches, and it's now you know it's since since the twenty the proportion coming from domestic games around the world has, has gone from about ten percent to about fifty percent now, and I think that that fifty percent figure will will rise and rise, um, and will you know football I think is about eighty percent, and perhaps cricket ends up there, maybe it doesn't quite re- reach reach that point, but. And um, that's the direction of travel. And again, that will probably increase in the quality as well, because clearly the biggest economies are in a, the best position to monetize their league. But, you know, I think there's an opportunity if we see some really innovative, interesting thinking um, in terms of domestic T20 leagues, like we could see, you know, who's to see, we can see some countries merging their, their, their leagues and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think the Champions League coming back would also be a great concept. So, yeah, lots of opportunities here, but it's whether administrators can come together. I mean, most administrators in most countries, you know, their priority tends to be what can we do to try and get another tour, you know, from India or maybe England, because that will kind of that will keep the lights on for a few more years. So in South Africa, they announced, uh, you know, a month ago they were having a three T Twenty tour from India in August, which I don't know that that will even happen because of the COVID situation. But that was meant to be worth ten million US dollars, so like a massive. So you get you get that in, and that you've done a good job as an administrator, and that. That's more important in the short term than than these these bigger picture stuff I talked about. But the, the point is, countries need to need to reduce their reliance on tools from India and just try and get a, a better model to sustain the, the international game. Otherwise, it really will become secondary to club cricket, and we could be in a situation where we have the World Cups and cricket still a big thing. But apart from that, international cricket is really struggling. Yeah, well, that that strikes me as the kind of irony about this year is that you know we haven't had any of these franchise leagues happening yet. Um, we expect that we will see the Caribbean Premier League uh, in the autumn, uh, perhaps with a more limited um, involvement of international players from from certain countries. Indian Premier League is going to happen by hook or by crook. We think they, they, you know, I think the latest reports coming out of India are that it might happen in a in a neutral country, just to get the, the television product out there. Um, but while there's been this gap. We can expect, as as the kind of uh, you know the the um, the impetus to make money comes in, uh, that, that some of these franchise leagues will become more significant. I mean, it feels to me, Tim, like the, the two pieces kind of have to go together because if if the baseline becomes club cricket, you can potentially strengthen the international game by giving uh, players from from emerging nations a bit more of a chance to play with with elite players. But then you also have to not have the international calendar be such a merry-go-round that that those teams are constantly playing without their best players. Yeah, no, you mean a bit like what happens in football. Yeah, I agree. In a, in a in a weird way, the the weak the weakening of international cricket could could lead to competitive balance in international cricket actually improving. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. You're listening to the Sports Pro Podcast. Let's look at at England, kind of in in microcosm because this was going to be this was the follow-up to to the blockbuster year last year the the plan had just about come together where England had won a World Cup um, and and gained a lot of public attention and then this was the the big return to free to air and of course the big launch of of the hundred which was this very kind of market tailored uh, competition that has caused all manner of heartache um, and and division but I think people were with beginning to to want to give a chance to this year had a fantastic roster of players signed up and of course is now not happening until 2021 because the um uh, you know the, the 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 idea of having a big fan outreach competition with no fans was uh was quite wisely i think uh, put to one side what 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 has this exposed about the english game because you have probably the most established um in professional terms, the most established domestic setup here. But again, you probably have the biggest kind of set of strains between competing interests. Yeah, but there's a there's a huge amount to sort of to, to juggle in, in England. And I think the the launch of the 100 next year, that that will change the landscape again, because you, for counties that they could, you know, effectively be the third form of, of cricket for people after international cricket and, and the 100 suddenly. Um, so that's going to put them in, going to open up new new strains for them. Um, I talked to some sort of leading figures from, from counties and there's there's kind of a growing sense that we might be at a stage where within four or five years, um, 
we lose some counties from first class cricket. So these counties, the counties don't go under. They carry on playing T20 Blast and One Day Cup, but they cease to play, you know, first class cricket, the county championship, which is what what loses and what loses everyone money really. Um, and yeah, that's just one of the the little things that again, it might have been it might have been kind of happening anyway in the in the long term. But I think as with so many things, we'll see what. Um, we'll see that the COVID just accelerates shifts that were already un- underway. But I think, you know, Tom Harrison is right when he says 100 is now more important than ever for English cricket. And that's because of what, 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 what I talked about earlier. So club cricket growing in, in importance around the world. Test cricket will get a harder, will become harder to, to, to put on, certainly in the short term, I think. And if the IPL, things like that expands, well, that means less time for to play India. So they can have their own tournament, which does not depend on other countries coming in. Well, that's, that's that's the golden ticket, really. So the hundred, whether you like it or not, will become more important for English cricket. And if and if the hundred fails, that will have catastrophic financial implications for all levels of English cricket. On top of the blow that's happened this summer because of COVID. So again, we're kind of seeing what we've seen uh, happening anyway. But perhaps the uh, just as the Test game internationally becomes a kind of more of a showpiece, um, perhaps we see a pairing down of, of the number of games played. But a, an increased emphasis on uh, on a core of teams who keep playing it. Perhaps the first class game in England, we see a similar kind of uh, of, of tiering. If that were to come to pass, if a few teams were to drop out of the county championship, which for for kind of international listeners has been going around for since I think before the invention of the radio, um, it, and eighteen teams playing now in two divisions for the last kind of twenty years or so, but. Has, has broadly gone unchanged with, with the odd tweak aside, but there's been discussions for as long as I can remember about whether you you have an intermediate tier between that and um, and the and the five day test game at international level, and, and you kind of have a bit more of a you know an incubation of, of elite players in that way, and maybe that's is that the conversation that gets accelerated by this. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And again, that's a conversation that was sort of underway before. Um, but is there, you know, the ECB is, you know, because of financial implications from COVID, race and Luke can lose 100 million um, this se- this season due to lack of crowds and everything. Um, so that that could mean, you know, that will mean, you know, everyone has to cut their cloth accordingly. And if we get to a situation, certainly with a new broadcasting deal, which doesn't kick in until 2025, but we're only a couple of ways from sort of serious you know, negotiations for that for that being underway. Well, that's clearly going to, easily going to take a big haircut on their kind of 1.1 billion deal, which they've got for 2024. Well, that, that's going to increase the pressure for, for counties to to try and reduce their, their outgrades. We're going to see certainly, you know, fewer professional players in England, probably pretty much an end to kind of lucrative over to you know glitzy overseas overseas coaches coming, fewer overseas players. So all of these steps and counties might might think and if they can get guarantees that they will not become a minor county or will stay, you know, in the blast and in the one day cup, then then they might think actually stepping out of four day cricket make them more, more viable as, you know, long term entities. I mean it's it's not an unpleasant decision, but this is certainly a, a time when yeah. Everyone's going to make tough cho- have to make tough choices <laughs> within the sport. I think you alluded there to the the potential shortfall that might be coming down the road in terms of broadcast revenues, and there will have been significant. You know, you mentioned as well the significant financial implications of of, of loss of ticket revenues and associated incomes there, and the spectre that was raised at the start of the spring was that you'd get investment in in other ways, and one of those ways might be the investment. You know, uh, um, allowing third-party investment into into teams in the hundred, which had been quite carefully guarded before. What would that do to the dynamics of uh, of cricket in this country? We do have, you know, you do have private ownership in in the IPL. Other leagues, kind of, there's a mix of models between that and and the kind of solely rights holder owned model that you've got in England and in um, uh, Australia. You know, what would it do to have potentially private owners coming in outside of the first class setup outside of uh outside of ecb involvement yeah it's certainly you know something that we we, we could see and it's one of those ideas that people are looking for new investment well suddenly that's an interesting conversation so Kolkata and knight riders they told me i think back in april that they would be interested in investing in in the hundred and 
kind of bringing one of their teams into their, their family. So they've already got a team, uh, obviously the Kolkata team, they've got a team in Trinidad, Trinbago Knight Riders under that family. They, they bought a team in, in the ill-fated global T20 league in South Africa. Um, so that they've almost got the Man City model for for cricket, basically. So yeah, they, they were interested in investing in, in a team. I talked to a number of other owners from teams in the Pakistan Super League, also Rajasthan Royals in the IPL, who were also interested in in either kind of buying a team or making an investment in, in a team, even if it's only for sort of a, a you know small ten or fifteen percent stake. So there is that interest. I mean, they'll, again, there'll be resistance resistance to that, but if if the I sorry, if the ECB sees it as a way of generating some 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 cash and also potentially opening up new opportunities, so if you had a, I guess if you had some IPL teams investing in, in the hundred, you know, would that would that help with the Indian market? I mean, it's it's clearly not as simple as, as that. Um, you know, the idea that you have an Indian owner and you get you get extra Indian eyeballs as one should it doesn't doesn't always it doesn't really work like that. It's not, but but whether that puts the ECB even a position long term, you know, the medium term, if you had couple of IPL owners, does that put the ECB in a better position to argue for Indian players to be allowed to play in the 100? You know, even if you, even if you had a deal where only kind of the non-mega stars of India, so no very code, but even if you just say Indian T20 specialists can, you know, if there's a test series going on, they can play the 100 at the same time. That would be, even that alone would be a massive, a massive thing for, for the ECB and, and the 100. Um, and whether they think private investment is a way to getting towards that, well, that that makes the idea more, more attractive. So I don't know if it will, if it will happen, but I do know it's, 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 it's a more realistic prospect um, than it was, you know, before March. Now, alongside all of these kind of existential questions um, in the last few weeks, as we have in, in pretty much every sport, there's been, uh, and I, you know, I hate to shoehorn this in at the end, but unfortunately that's, that's just the position that I've managed to put myself in, in here. But we've had this conversation about, representation um it's particularly poignant i think because we have west indies coming over this summer you know that you look around the english game and you see how few black players there are and have been in the last kind of 15 20 years how few uh, minorities are represented in uh, administrative positions and and commercial positions although there, there are there are exceptions to that and just kind of how stratified the game is um in terms of people's backgrounds what what are some of the conversations that you've heard in that respect? I mean, this is very very much the start of any progress that's that's going to be made will will be this summer. But what are some of the conversations you've you've heard? Well, I mean, clearly the, the lack of representation is a huge problem. You know, I did an interview with, with Mark Elaine, and he's the only Black British head coach of a county since 1990, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and he won two trophies in four years, and hasn't even got. An interview for a county job since, which which does suggest there has been some some huge bars, you know, conscious or unconscious um, in English cricket. I think there's clearly um, the ECB a couple of years ago launched a South Asian action plan, which is which is welcome. We still you know, haven't seen the full fruits of that, but um, but we need to, you know that there needs to be you know more of an effort made in that. There needs to be a similar a similar similar steps taken for African Caribbean cricket, um, which is you know really really been in a bad position in English cricket. So we've seen a number of African of British African Caribbean players uh in the first last game decrease from thirty three in nineteen ninety four to nine last season. Um so you know three quarters drop. So yeah, massive issues with ECB to to address and they haven't you know that, that has not been a priority at all. Um African Caribbean rep- representation in, in cricket um over the last few years. Um so hopefully now, you know we do see that that change um, and that would obviously be be very welcome you know it's the right thing to do but also it's a way of actually hopefully helping the ecb by you know getting more you know helping to engage more more fans and more you know more players and just you know making it a more representative game you know for everybody and fighting the the kind of um the issues that english cricket has yeah i mean it it feels to me like this is uh this is really the subject for an entire other podcast and I'm sure it's, some, it's something it, that we will uh, get to, but the, um, or something that's certainly something that we will, we will do, but the, um, yeah, I think, I think that that's a, that's a really salient point. The idea that it's the fact that the game became very exclusive, you know, but going behind a paywall to kind of guarantee its existence and, and so on meant meant it's become easier for it to kind of become less representative and and for some of those things 
to go unnoticed over a long period of time and to and to fester. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as I say, well, that's that's one for another day, but certainly one that that we will return to. Um, we're going to hear from Steve Alworthy, the uh, director of events at the England and Wales Cricket Board, about the processes that have been put in place in order to get cricket played safely uh, this summer, the uh, planning and the conversations that went on with public health authorities and with international boards, the many different steps and uh, and protocols that have been established around venues, the business of keeping an events team going um, without any kind of contact over the last few months uh, and a few more things as well. It's a really, really interesting conversation and it is coming up right after this. Help us spread the word about the Sports Pro podcast. Subscribe, like and share our content on social. Join the conversation on Twitter with a hashtag Sports Pro Pod. And if you're enjoying our work, why not leave us a rating and a nice review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you want to get in touch, you can send us an email, podcast at sportspromedia.com. The Sports Pro Podcast, we're listening to. Steve Alworthy, Director of Events at the England and Wales Cricket Board. Welcome again to the Sports Pro Podcast. Uh, very good to be on. Very good to be on and looking forward to having a good chat. Yeah, it was, it's good to have you back. Um How's the new role, Steve? Is it is it everything you expected when you uh, moved over from the Cricket World Cup last year? Yeah, it's it 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 definitely is. Obviously, I've been at the ECB for a while now, and um, I suppose across two organisations, the ECB and the ICC, delivering a few of their events um, over the last couple of years. But um, you know, it was fantastic to uh, to to have the ECB chat to me towards the end of the World Cup and the back end of last year, two thousand and nineteen, um, to to stay on full time um, and to help deliver uh, the hundred, which was um, going to be launched uh, this year in twenty twenty, um, and then also look after all of ECB's uh, international and domestic cricket so tests only rst 20s and similarly for the domestic so yeah it, it it absolutely is it's um it's a great place to work and uh, i've been with the ecb now for 12 years so uh, i'm enjoying every minute of it but i'm sure when when you sat down with them you know towards the end of last summer um they were not saying right steve we need you to deliver us uh, a few test matches with no fans whatsoever as few people as we can get away with in the ground you know, just having every player tested as, as often as we can and have complete exclusion zones. And it's it's kind of, it's turned everything on its head. Oh, it's, yeah, even into the beginning of this year, you know, as you say, never mind the back end of last year, this year we were planning for a full season. It was, um, you know, it was on the back of an incredibly successful World Cup and an unbelievable Ashes series from an international point of view, as well as um, as well as both the domestic season, it was a it was an unbelievable 2019. Um, when you think about it, and you think of the cricket and the the successes on the field were amazing. Um, so you know, within a couple of months at the beginning of 2020, it's um, you know at one point in time we were looking at at actually no cricket at all. Um, you know that was the that was the absolutely worst case scenario. Um, and then everything in between, as I said, the beginning of the year, it was a full season. And then suddenly it was actually no season. Um, and then you start as a, when you start planning and you think contingency wise, uh, you look at every single option in between um, and, a, and, a, and variations of each one um, right the way through. And you start prioritizing what's important and, um, and then start putting plans together. So it was, pr- it was just one very big, massive contingency plan. And as you say, you think of think of where we're at now and um, what's going to be delivered. And in, a, in, a, in on the on the eighth of July, the first Test match um, between two international teams behind closed doors is um, is yeah. It's a, it's been an unbelievable journey, incredibly challenging, but um, it's been it's been incredible to to work through. I mean, I want to get into the the kind of logistics of actually delivering the events themselves um, over the next couple of months, but something that we talked about um, last summer when you were bringing that uh, bringing that World Cup to life was some of the way that you, you know you had a, a a team that existed for the short term and a lot of what you were doing was about managing people and making sure people felt you know comfortable in their roles and energized and all the rest of it and you were doing things like having big group wide huddles on a Monday morning and and calling upon people to, to explain what they were working on and all that type of stuff. Obviously now 
as with many, many other people, um, you've been scattered to all parts and people working from home. And what's that done from a management point of view, particularly when I guess the picture on the ground is shifting quite a lot and your your responsibilities and your deliverables are shifting quite a lot. What are some of the things that you've kind of, you know, you've looked to as a baseline to keep that team together? Yeah, I think um, that's probably, um, as you as you explained there, about the way we managed and ran the Cricket World Cup with a team of just over 120-odd people, 130-odd people, um, and a way you, you keep the entire... The, the, the entire organizing committee together and feeling part of it um, and I think it's you know initially when we when we uh, had to leave the offices um, and start working from home in an environment um, which although it, well it is it, it, it's isolated at home um, and everybody's got different challenges at home uh, depending on what your your family circumstances are. You know, they, you you are sitting in a room in front of a laptop um, where we were talking about um, pre this doing a, a lot less online, becoming and doing a bit more of a digital detox, and uh, it was certainly something that was very very much on the on the radar and and making sure people had some downtime, um, and that suddenly turned itself on its head. So, you know, I think. The, uh, the 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 meetings that we now have, and it's it's actually quite interesting, as you say there. You know, we used to do it once a week um, on a Monday at twelve o'clock, and the entire uh, the entire organisation got together to discuss the Cricket World Cup to feel ownership of it. Um, I think what we're doing now is we we're actually uh, meeting a lot more frequently. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we've got a, a half hour check in at five. Um, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have significant team meetings then where everybody's in and we do a bit more of a deep dive into the project plan. Um, so I'm actually spending a lot more time face to face with the entire group and sharing a lot more information on a daily basis with the group. I think the thing you do lack, though, is you lack the energy in the room because clearly you, everybody's sitting in their own home environment um, with different challenges at home. So I think that's been that's been the toughest thing is that, you know, you, you can often feed off the energy in the room and you can see people's faces and you've got the enthusiasm and it's and you, there, there's just a, an atmosphere and a, and, a, and a vibe within the office and excitement in the office that, that builds and it's a bit contagious. I think that's probably one of the things that we've lacked, um, you know, because although we are seeing each other a lot more, we, we've lost a bit of that, that sort of um, ele- energy in the room. But it's, it's, it's certainly, you know, from a planning point of view, we've had a lot more face time. Um, which has been which has been fantastic and actually um, not a problem at all in terms of planning it. Um, and, but it's all it all feels odd because although you're seeing a lot more, you still feel very isolated because as soon as you hang up, you're on your own back in that room again by yourself. You know, um, so it, it's very difficult. Whereas when you're in the office, you, you you're still walking around the office and you're still feeding off the energy within the room. But it's been it's been a it's been an incredible learning actually. Yeah, I mean. It has- has it helped once you've moved and, you know, we'll go on to this in a sec about the, the path that the plans themselves have taken, but once you've moved from that point where it's all contingency planning and it's all um, exploring the possible and you're now saying, right, we have a match starting on the 8th of July and we need to deliver training conditions and everything else before that, you, you're basically working in intangibles as opposed to intangibles has has that helped has that galvanized people a bit it definitely has and i think that's the you know as soon as we could um uh and this is the the, the key is that, you know there are a number of areas of this this massive piece that we we're working towards and so when you think about it from a contingency point of view um the the the, the piece in the middle of the jigsaw was the schedule and being able to agree a um a set of matches with international teams. Um, And that was the first piece of the jigsaw that we needed to get locked away. So as soon as we had a schedule, we had touring teams, uh, significant numbers of meetings with overseas boards, with the West Indies, with Pakistan, with Ireland, with Australia, who all the four four international teams that are coming. You know, once we got that, um, that schedule 
semi-confirmed or the, initially the ones at the beginning of the season confirmed, you know, then we could start planning and mapping out when we needed to be on site. So we split the team up into groups and we ended up taking over a couple of different sites. And I think you, you immediately you could see the, the, the impact of that, but still obviously socially distanced and medically safe with PPE and all the rest of it. But, you know, all of those plans coming to life that you you developed uh, online and on face to face on laptops and uh, on spreadsheets suddenly was coming to life on the ground. Um, and there's definitely been a bit more of that resurgence on the ground with with people and FaceTime, um, which is which is absolutely fantastic because, you know, everything we've done with this is is a first. It's the first time we've ever done it. So it doesn't matter what um, area or what element of the season you're developing or you are planning it's always the first because you've always got a, the COVID-19 lens on top of it. So you know, the normal stuff you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you've suddenly got to rethink that through all of the different protocols of medical, of government guidance, um, of, of the COVID lens, of infection rates, of people on site, you know, all of those different elements. So every time you do something, I say it's, it's a first for all of it. So that's what that's what project teams do and what event teams do you plan it and you can visualize it and when you get it on site because we've worked with these grounds um for for a number of years um you can picture it and when you get on site it's it's a it's a process of then just implementing so yeah i think i think the team have definitely uh, benefited from 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 being on site and having a bit more face time let's let's take it back a few steps i mean you know, if you think about the the path that this uh, pandemic has taken in the UK specifically, you when we were first approaching kind of lockdown measures and all of that type of thing, the cricket season still felt a little way off. I mean, we were probably talking a matter of weeks at that point in, when you'd have expected the season games happening. But then, as you said, we went through a period where we didn't know if there'd be any possibility of play at all. And now there's some confidence that there'll be a, We'll, we'll get through this season that we have where you've got several teams coming to visit and, you know, county games happening and, and potentially uh, games at other levels being brought back in as well. What what course did the discussions take that you had um, with the senior leadership at the ECB, with external figures? How was all of that coordinated? What It's a very nebulous question that I quite like quite a, um, you know, logical answer to basically yeah, yeah listen, I, it's i think the thing you've you know the, the the real consideration here was i suppose when you look at the the macro picture of where uh the virus was spreading around the world and it was uh, you you could see it moving around the world couldn't you i think we were all aware of that in some places where there were peaks others were coming out others were still weeks away from peaks potentially and that's always the very interesting conversation when you're having a, you know, we were having a discussion with, you know, the, the West Indies uh, board to get the, the West Indian team over here and the fantastic collaboration that we had with them, you know, and they were coming from a effectively a COVID free um, society and environment in the West Indies to to the uk um where we were having these discussions where some of the uk rates were were the highest around so you know that's a that's a that's a very very um, interesting and difficult discussion to be having with people and sharing your plans with them of of the safety that we have absolutely put as primacy in all of this that we would do absolutely everything in our powers to make it safe and then you you know and we we, we look at what's happening now in pakistan pakistan have arrived they they they're in um, in worcester doing their, their quarantine and training camp you know they're a couple of weeks away from their peak apparently you know of what's happening in pakistan so that's it that you you go from one end of the scale to the other um but i think the point being is that the plans that we've developed here within the UK and all of the measures that we had taken, we put in place, spending numerous hours on conference calls with them and Teams calls and Zoom calls, being able to share documentation with them of what it would be like and all of the measures we had taken to keep them safe. I think that's where it, you know, that's where it started because we had to have the commitment of the wider international cricket community to this. Um, otherwise, nothing would, you know, nothing. It, it, 
England are here and they, they're ready to play, but we need we need opposition to play against. And, you know, a huge kudos to, to the West Indies, to Pakistan, to Ireland, um, that, you know, that they are that they, they are getting on planes and they are here in the UK now, um, which is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, so, you know, that's that's some of the process and protocol, but it's it you know it's it's spending time speaking to people and giving them the confidence that um, the medical and the government guidance and the medical advice and the medical plans we had in place were the safest that we could deliver. And what's the experience been like of of being a a rights holder and and running events um, of dealing with public health authorities? What how has that practically how has that been managed? Has it been a case of you know, have, have there been briefings delivered to the chief executive or have you been a point person? What, what's, how's that been coordinated? Yeah, well, we've got within the ECB, there are, there, there are two separate departments that, that deal with the, our public policy department that deal with, um, that deal with government. Um, and then we've obviously got our science and medicine that deal with, with all the medical, um, the medical officer, the chief medical officers, and they get their, um, they get their information and there's collaboration across both. Um, and I can absolutely say that it's it's been some of the best collaboration we've seen. It's been it's absolutely it's been outstanding actually. The DCMS and the government guidance and the stages that we're at now with stage three being printed, stage four um, just around the corner. Um, and as we all know, there's the next stage is stage five, which is um, which is expecting possibly crowds back in grounds at some point in time. So you know, there's been some really there's been some really fantastic conversations sessions there with them um, and, and some very and fantastic support actually um, and then all of the medical uh, information has come through our science and medicine guys um, and uh, we've got a, a, a smallish medical team um, but they've done an incredible job and um, put together a medical plan based on all the, the, the medical advice that we've got from the top chief medical officers in the UK to help us develop those plans um, and in actual fact some of our some of the people in the science and med department are, are actually on some of those groups at the highest level um, so you know I think that is uh, that's testimony to to the collaboration and support we've had from from government and and, and the medical teams let's look I mean we're we are speaking um, the week before the first balls bowled uh, down in Southampton we this podcast will be going out I think at the start of day two I can't remember I haven't got my head screwed on quite yet with with dates but the um, what do the next few days look like? As, as we're talking, we're kind of wrapping up. This. West Indies have been playing an intramural game, uh, training game up in Manchester. Um, England have been playing one as well with, with their thirty man squad. They will both pick teams now in the next week. What can those teams expect? What can the all the you know support teams? What can media? What what do the what does the test match look like under these conditions? It, it looks different, I think, depending on which stakeholder group you are, actually, um, because there's, there's obviously different areas of the, um, of the venue that are in, in states of zone and lockdown. So, you know, for, as you say, the West Indies, they've, they've just completed their, their, yesterday, they completed their final three-day practice match up at Old Trafford. Um, and they have, done, well, we've been talking here, I've just got a couple of WhatsApps and texts from the guys down at the Aegeus Bowl, um, and they've just arrived actually at the Aegeus Bowl um, on site. So we've now got the West Indies and England on site down at the Aegeus and um, prepping and ready to to the final couple of days before the first test match. And then we've got um, Pakistan who are uh, concluding or in the middle of their 14 day quarantining after them flying over last week. They're at Worcester um, and they're at uh, staying at the, and I'll, I'll touch on this in a, in a second, they're staying in Worcester on site on the hotel there and then obviously um, training and playing um, at the Worcester ground. So I think one of the key elements to to, to securing this and actually making sure that we can develop and um, deliver uh, an incredibly uh, safe environment for the players is that I think from a cricket point of view, we, we're pretty blessed with the number of um, grounds that we have out there that actually have on-site hotels. 
so as I've said, you've got the you've got both the the Hiltons at, at the Old Trafford and the Aegeus. You've got a Premier Inn down at uh, Worcester. We've got a travel lodge up in Derby, and then there's um, a lodge with rooms up at up at Headingley. But there's only thirty six rooms up there. Um, so we have facilities where we've got on site accommodation, and that is probably one of the most key elements that we've been able to deliver what we have because the challenges come with multi-day sport of obviously test cricket being multi-day and having to have people stay over and sleep over for significant periods of time i think if you've it's a little it's obviously different when you come to the one day series or even a t20 series where potentially teams can come in play a game and then leave and you don't necessarily need overnight accommodation for example um, which is probably more relevant from a domestic point of view but international it's important that we had this hotel on site that the teams that were involved and the critical uh, staff that are required to deliver that match to make sure it can go ahead are all on site and what we call then stay in that secure bubble. So each of the grounds have been divided up into two zones, the green zone being the inner zone with the with the teams and the critical staff to deliver um, the match, and then the outer zone, which is the amber zone, and then that is that is for all of the, the third party suppliers, external staff, venue staff, um, and they they sit in a different zone. So effectively, you know, they, they would then, those people in the outer zone, they don't have to stay on the on-site hotel. They will stay at a, at a hotel off-site, but still having to go through the testing protocols. But it's very clean and clear to make sure that the zones don't mix. Um, so if, it depends on where you are. And I said, depending on which stakeholder you are. But from a player's point of view, you know, they've, they've been tested and uh, tested regularly, um, full PCR tests. Um, and then they, once they're in the bubble, they stay in the bubble, but that bubble being the hotel and the ground, the playing field, the training facilities, the indoor school, the gym, those sorts of areas, um, the, the restaurants, and but all laid out, all demarcated with, with social distancing guidelines, with limiting numbers of people within rooms. So you calculate the square meterage of the room. Then based on the number of people that you could have in that room, you work out how many can go in. So, um, you know, uh, four people or 16 people, depending on the size of the room, to make sure that people stay socially distanced. So the whole hotel and the entire in a bubble environment has been set up with one-way systems, with signage, um, and all at socially distant spaces, everybody having their own unique spaces, whether you're eating, whether you're sleeping, whether you're working. Um, and that's sort of the inner zone. So that's what the players the players will expect. Um, and then in the outer zone, slightly different, but uh, still having to go through a testing protocol. So as you've seen on TV with sort of those NHS stations where you drive through um, to get tested, we've set up one of those facilities outside of each of every one of these grounds. Um, actually, not outside. They're on. They're on the ground. They're within the ground footprint, um, and you drive in. It was. It's what we are encouraging people to do: to drive and not take public transport. Um, obviously, limiting contact with with people outside in the normal community. Um, and then you drive in. You go through your testing. There's a online health questionnaire that you've got to fill in every single day, and you get tested. And if you are clear, you can go to the on-site parking where you pick up your accreditation, and then you have a specific area and zone which is all color coded on the floor footsteps which you have to follow and your accreditation color matches the color of the footsteps and you follow those footsteps to where you actually have to go within the within the within the venue so you stay within your zone limiting the the the, the contact with people with within other zones within the within the bubble so yeah it's very specific and very detailed but um you know effectively what we're doing here is you you a normal test match day over a seven day period, which the teams normally come in two days before and then a five day test match. What you've done is you've unpacked the entire test match. You've taken it apart and you've put it back together with the COVID lens on top of it. Um, and that's sort of what we've done, um, you know, down to protocols of the groundsman if it rains, that when they have to bring the covers onto the field, there's a protocol for that because they we, we can't have them um, brushing up and running against or running into players when they're running off the field. Um, who's pulling out the stumps? You know, who's touched those stumps? Who's allowed to pull them out? Who puts them on the ground? Who puts them back in the ground when the, it comes off? You know, all of that level of detail, the stuff that we, we, we have, we've been considering. Yeah, I mean, this incredible 
density to that planning. But what what happens when you're you're dealing with um, you know obviously there's going to be third party stakeholders or well, they're not quite third parties because they're they're partners but you know the Sky Sports and the BBC on the broadcast side and um, other media who are going in and uh, how, how who's been responsible for working up plans is that have you had to create those and, and hand them off and say this is what we're going to expect of you when you're at the ground or have they have they contributed their own protocols how's that worked yeah we, initially we drew up the plans based on the, the the medical advice and the government guidance so we we put together a, a a plan in place um, and then we spent a lot of time talking to as you say like Sky and the BBC we spent a lot of time um, explaining the process and what we had to go through uh, and then clearly from their side as you say they've got their own protocols you know they've their, their trucks if you think of what a broadcast truck is like um, you know it's a it's a it's a pretty confined space with anything between probably five and ten people in it in, in a very close in a very closed environment um, so they were having to work out their own protocols of how they were going to produce and deliver cricket and we had to then take that into account we had to overlay that within our own plans and we've come together with as a as a as the cricket family and we've all agreed uh, the the current plan that we have now so i think we're in a really strong place but again it's just it's it's just been fantastic collaboration for everybody's will to to get uh, cricket back on the summer and ensure that we get some test cricket away but yeah it was it was all just about sharing those plans with them after we had developed i suppose the framework of what we of the structure of what we were thinking at the ground and then it was how we implemented based on their own guidance and their own duty of care to their freelance photographers or their freelance cameramen or their on-site commentators or riggers or whatever it is um we then had conversations with them so yeah it's been it's been a it's been a seriously big collaborative piece of work which has been fantastic actually what's the procurement been like as well because you will have event partners you'll have people who you typically work in to deliver a normal event um whether that's if, if it's it could be catering it could be whatever kind of staff you need or or what have you and you're now coming to a point where probably between april and now you're thinking okay who who can get tests done for us who can provide screens that we might need all that type of stuff that, to, to create a biosecure environment which is a kind of question that i wasn't ever expecting to have to ask when i started out in 2020 but what what what's what's that process involved have you gone through typical partners have you had to kind of find uh organizations who who have been working this stuff up where where have you um yeah how have you organized that yeah we've 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 had we've got partnerships in place for for what I would call as a, a normal a, a normal international or domestic season. Um, so you know we've got long term standing agreements with with a number of these organisations. Um, it was all just about it. It was just changing the the graphic design of what we were printing. You know, effectively there was just a lot more um, signage and wayfinding signage um, that that we required um, stuff whether or not you know instead of instead of backdrops for interviews and producing all of those types of um, th- that type of collateral we were you know there were signage for testing stations for hand sanitization for cleaning for this for the other you know the two meter social distancing piece the one way system with the you know those, those partners we've had a, had on board and we've kept them on you know They've, they've delivered for us the season as well, so um, that's not been a that's not been a problem at all. It's just it's just a change in in the in the um, the product that we require. So and they've done an incredible job actually. They've turned stuff around incredibly quickly, um, and their procurement has been obviously their procurement has been spot on. So um, we haven't missed any of the deadlines. We're all on track, which is great. I suppose the point that the one area which we 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 weren't clearly at the beginning of the season considering was the testing protocols. Um, you know, of of the actual tests themselves, so the PCR tests or the antigen tests and uh, the monitoring and the screening and the logistics of all of that. Um, 
And then, um, then there's the occupational health side of it. So we'll have occupational health on site um, and all of that coverage. So we've effectively now got a, a, a partnership with a company called Pronetics who uh, do the, the Premier League testing. Um, and we partnered with them. And, um, you know, they, they are they're at the forefront of doing all of this these tests for us. Uh, today, I, I just popped down to... Um, I'm going on site uh, to to Worcester on on down to, to to see the Pakistan team and spend a few days there before I go to the test match at Aegeus. Um, You know, I just I've had two tests already, and I've I've just popped down to get my my third test this morning. And it was I just drove half an hour away to to High Wycombe. They they did a test on me, and uh, I'll get the results tomorrow. If I'm clear, then I can I can head in with through the self assessment um, and the the. The online platform that we've got and I, I can get into the not in the bubble I certainly won't be in the bubble because the PMOA and the team bubble is different but I'll be in the amber zone effectively in the outside being able to support them with whatever I need but it's it's as it's as simple as that it's been brilliant and then you've got occupational health on site um, helping you manage all of that process and protocol with people getting on site which we didn't have obviously um, uh, last season or any of the seasons before so um, yeah that's a new bit to the procurement side of us just on the subject of of those tests we, there have been some uh some anxious moments obviously pakistan had uh, a bit of a shock when they tested their squads or their original squad um last week and and found was it 10 positive tests in the end for their their touring party or their prospective touring party and we've had uh, in, on the English side, Sam Curran and, and Joffre Archer have both had to do additional tests in, in Joffre's case because of uh, contact and in Sam's case because he's ill with something else. And Phil Simmons sadly had to, to attend a funeral, so had to step out of the bubble for West Indies. What kind of protocols are in place if somebody does test positive, given how much contact there is? it's you know, You're talking about games where even just the game itself, the teams are together for five days and then you add all the preparation, all all the rest that's gone into it. Yeah, um, and I think the, the the testing protocol and the tests to highlight if somebody does test positive, there's a there's a really specific pr- protocol around that, um, and that is that they are immediately isolated. We've got isolation rooms around the ground, um, and then we've have to we, we, as part of. The, the government guidance, you've got to appoint a COVID-19 officer on site, medical officer on site. Um, they would be informed immediately um, and they probably would know anyway through the testing protocols and the, the thermal tests that, that happen when you move between zones all the time. Um, but it's all done remotely, effectively, without stopping people. There's We've got thermal cameras around which monitor which monitor people. So we, you know, that's all, that will all be, be pretty much instantaneous so the COVID-19 officer would be would be um, informed as I said you probably know that person would then be isolated immediately they'd have to go into seven days automatic isolation through through the normal government and medical guidance um, public health England so if it's Trafford up in at Old Trafford Trafford Council and or Hearts or down in the Eastley Borough Council um, they would be informed public health England depending on where, when, how, um, they would then make an assessment of um, that individual and what is required and further tests. Um, and then there would be a, and clearly that's why social distancing is so important still within the bubble, because obviously that is trying to minimize the contact of that person with other members within the within the touring party or other members with their, be that uh, staff or um you know, um, team management, for example. Um, so if those protocols are adhered to, then um, and the, a, a tracking and tracing um, in terms of where they've been, what they've done, um, and then being able to work backwards from that. Um, but uh, as I say, depending on where you are, when the games are, I mean, where it is happens within the game, um, the game will still continue. You're allowed a COVID replacement. Um, so the new protocols from ICC, um, and then effectively you've got to replace that player with as close a like-to-like player as possible out of the touring squad. Now, that's one of the nuances of this, is that the touring squads are significantly bigger than they normally are, because again, they need to be able to replace people, um, and also they need to be fully self-sufficient. So normally we supply 
you know, many, many net bowlers to bowl to these guys in the training sessions and before they play. They've had to, we, we haven't done any of that this time around. They've had to be fully self-sufficient to stay in the bubble and keep everybody together. So, you know, the touring squad would be big enough. They'd be able to find a COVID replacement and the game would continue. So uh, the protocol is pretty, pretty, pretty rigid around that. This is the Sports Pro Podcast. Um, the priorities around which games are being delivered are obviously tied very heavily to commercial uh, imperatives, and we we understand why that is. The game's got to support itself going forward, and I think that's true for for pretty much every sport this this summer. They've they've all kind of gone what's deliverable and what checks against broadcast contracts and uh, and the priorities for our partners and that type of thing. But what have you learned from the process of putting these games together? That you can then bring to uh, bring to cricket further down the pyramid. So starting with the domestic game, um, the women's game, which isn't further down the pyramid, but is you know they, they they have tended to be smaller events and and carry less value in within the broadcast contracts. Um, and then the grassroots game, which is a bit of a bone of contention here in the UK. Maybe it won't be by the time this podcast goes out, but we shall see. But there's some confusion as to just how dangerous it is and just how essential a cricket tea is um but what what kind of what best practice can you take from delivering the elite event and and you know apply it to other parts of the professional game and then the amateur game yeah i think you know the as i said at the beginning here you know the thing about this is you, you we, we are and we were planning and we still are planning for 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 the very worst case scenario so in other words you know full lockdown um full social distancing restrictions um all of those different elements our planning was always going to be completely belts and braces from the top um just to make sure that we had done absolutely everything we can to keep it safe and secure um and then depending on where the curve is and how we oscillate out the back of the curve um, and how restrictions are lifted lockdowns are lifted you know we would then be able to possibly unbolt different elements of it to to ease whatever we needed um and i suppose that's the learning for us depending on where we are because we're still talking as you know we're still talking a, a pretty long way away um you know i know we as you talk about the broadcast contract and i think this is a discussion that we had with the game that we needed to prioritize the really the, the high value cricket um which obviously is the international game to start um and making sure that we got the international game away and being able to deliver that in a in as, as as safe and secure environment as possible um but then also to start thinking about and this was the point i made earlier about the about the schedule itself so being able to deliver a schedule with cricket as far into the back end of the summer as possible. So, you know, pushing all of our cricket content starting in as it is now, starting in July, the test match this week or next week, sorry, um, with domestic cricket to set to start on the 1st of August. So, you know, we're pushing as much content and squeezing it as tight as we can into effectively a three month period to the end of to the end of September. But I think the learning is, is that we've got a we have an uh, an incredibly robust, strong plan in place for the international game. And that can be scaled depending on where we are and what we need. Um, you know, we've also, and you talk about the women's game there, you know, we're incredibly lucky that we're going to see international women's cricket in September too, between um, South Africa, India and South Africa, a tri-series. Um, and that is, we, 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 we're delivering, we're going to be delivering that. So that's going to be uh, fantastic for, for the women's game. And as you say, then from a domestic perspective, perspective you've got yourself a um, a domestic schedule um, which is still fairly flexible at the moment um, depending on what cricket is going to be played in August and um, September but you know I think the point being is that we need to be flexible um, depending on where we are to be able to deliver what cricket we can so we want to be able to play some form of cricket but I, again I, I go I suppose the point you asked is that whatever we've delivered at an international level you can learn from that and you can scale it depending on where you are so whether it's the social distancing it's the setup of the change rooms it's the the way you provide your food it's the score boxes it's the you know all of those different elements that we've developed at an international they can be replicated right the way across the game um, from from recreational cricket right the way through to um, to to the top of the 
international game. Now, your your priority this year was going to be um, the hundred, which is was one of the first decisions that was taken was to, to you know that wouldn't work without fans, so we'll move that to another year. Um, what what is twenty twenty one looking like at the moment? Are you even thinking about that yet? Are you kind of is it still a kind of um, is it still a kind of rolling daily weekly approach that you're taking to everything at this point? Yeah, to be to be honest, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get twenty twenty out of the way first. <laughs> but listen, it, it's a, it's a it's a important and a good question, and it's certainly you know it's not it's not certainly not lost the fact that twenty twenty one is just around the corner, and we've got um, you know it's a big summer. It's a it's a it's a huge summer with with um, with India touring and the launch of the hundred and all the rest of it. So um, you know, at the moment, my focus is now is really the first test match and getting to the end of September, trying to get these four international teams uh, in this country and and get these games played, which is obviously the top priority. But there is a parallel universe here in terms of um, keeping an eye on what 2021 looks like, um, because we, you know, you have to, um, and we've we, we we you've got to you can't just be thinking so short termism um, that we've got to be thinking about what what possibly 2021 would look like, um, and as we have before um, with discussions with overseas boards, you know those conversations are ongoing whether it be with India or uh, the, the touring teams that are coming, uh, those conversations are happening because you know and you know what this you know what this uh, the, the, this country is like with with cricket and with uh, with other sporting events and and wanting to get in you've 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 got to be you've got to be well in advance of when those series start so that people are aware of them coming and um and whether or not they want to to get involved with buying tickets or not so you know that there is a parallel part of uh, the organization looking at 21 yeah and what's the approach to that because i mean given that event management is usually so deliberate and there's a lot of logistics to stay on top of and you want to make sure things arrive in the right order and all that type of stuff when you really don't know what November is going to look like, never mind April, May next year, you know how how do you how do you approach that from a from a planning perspective? Do you have parallel plans running? Do you just keep everything as fluid as you can? What 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 do you think is going to be the the way of looking at that? Well, I think the way I look at that is that um, we've got a we've got a plan in place to deliver behind closed doors cricket as we are going to be doing in the next couple of months. So if that needs to be delivered again, we can deliver it because we've got the plans in place. And we've also delivered in 2019 uh, an unbelievable season under normal circumstances. So we'll be able to deliver whatever 21 throws at us because we've got plans at both ends of the scale. It just depends on where we land on that scale and what's required. Um, so I think, you know, from a planning point of view, the team are that the team are well enough experienced to do that. And I think the venues themselves are, you know, they've, they've delivered the stuff in, you know, year in, year out. Um, if we do have to overlay a bit more of a, an operational uh, COVID lens on it, we'd be able to adapt that accordingly. So, yeah, I think we'll, we'll still be in a very good place. If you think what we've pulled together um, in April, May and June you know, you've, you talk about a three-month period to be able to get to where we are now that we've got test cricket happening next week. Um, I think I'd be fairly confident in saying that whatever 21 throws at us, we should be okay. Now you've been working in delivering cricket events for what? I mean, you're coming up to about 15 years um, since you stopped playing and, and, and moved into this line of work. Has this made you think differently about events in any way? It definitely has. I, it, it's there, there. There are a number of things that I, it, it does make you really consider the way you the way you function, um, the way you operate, the the power that you could, the power of technology actually, um, of being able to how much stuff you know. One of the the first questions I asked the team because one of the key criteria was to have as fewer people on site as possible. Um, to deliver these games was what technology can we use or what can we do remotely from the ground where we don't need people on the ground to be able to to do our job that has certainly 
that has certainly challenged some of the thinking um, and and it certainly will in the future. So that is one side of it. But, we, you know, when you take out the, when you take out the customer, when you take out the fan, um, it's, it, it, it does put a it does put a different lens on it completely, um, and I think you you lose a lot of connection um, by not having those fans in the in the ground, um, and it 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 is very very odd. It feels very odd, and I think you know we we have learned a lot, and whether it be the technology side or the other side of how actually important um, fans are to to the game and to the atmosphere in the ground and just having a look at these practice matches and what have you. Um, there's some of the stark realities of both sides of the pendulum of, I have really hit home, but it's been an, it's been an incredibly, it's been an incredible exercise actually. Um, and one that I'll, I'll never forget. It's just been, it's just been an unbelievable experience, but you know, it's um, it, it, hopefully these experiences will help us make cricket better a lot better and a lot stronger when we come out of it at the other whether it's a leaner a leaner or more agile or more digital um you know all those different elements um we can we can suddenly think about how we put those into play all right well best of luck with it all steve and, and thanks very much for your time no worries at all fantastic to speak to you join the conversation with the sports pro community follow us on twitter at sports pro find us on instagram at sportspro.media and connect to Sports Pro Media on LinkedIn, where you can also become a part of our specialist OTT community. Sports Pro, connecting and inspiring the business world of sport. Welcome back to the Sports Pro podcast. Thank you to Steve Alworthy for his time there. Tim, before I let you go, I just wanted to, uh, to give you a chance to talk about the, the Wisdom Book of the Year. Congratulations on that one. Oh, well, th- thanks very much. It was certainly a, a nice surprise in uh, lockdown. <laughs> Well, it's, it's Cricket 2.0 Inside the T20 Revolution, uh, which you co-wrote with uh, with Freddie Wilde. And it's about basically the, the history of, of 2020 cricket. It's kind of amazing that it's taken this long for somebody to, to produce um, something on it. But you've kind of, uh, or certainly to produce something so authoritative on it, but you've, you've taken all of those elements together, the um, kind of cultural changes that it's wrought, the economic changes... And also some of the tactical developments as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you said, we were kind of. I mean, I guess the book stemmed ultimately from wanting to find a book on this on T Twenty to, to read, and kind of we, we couldn't find that. So we thought the next best thing would be to try, try and write the book we wanted to read. Um, so yeah, it, it's really it, it's it's a, it's designed for not just non T Twenty fans, even non cricket fans, to sort of to read and to be able to understand how this new sport has come up along you know we see so many sports trying to reinvent themselves and cricket has actually done this more successfully than any other you know so far that this this century um so yeah i mean we we talked sort of 80 people um you know from greats like you know morgan ricky ponting kieran pollard to administration stuff um yeah to explain you know how how it came about the way it's changing the game, you know, on on and off the field. So things like you know the the rise of club cricket, what it's really like to be a, a freelance player, and and that you know that when you're kind of like almost like a tennis player, you get you you know you get players with their own coaches and, and stuff. And so you know how the West Indies built a dynasty in T Twenty cricket. All this, all the talk of you know the West Indies declining Test cricket, which we hear so, so often, but kind of on the quiet, you know, they've become the first great international T Twenty team. You know, went into the last three World Cups as well. And um, yeah, so we've kind of gone on a, a journey to understand how this 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 new sport is is changing massively before our, before our eyes and you know, get under the skin of it. And it was um, yeah, it was it was fun to do. I think I think that bears a bit more. Uh, I think that bears talking about a bit more the. Um the rise of West Indies in this format, because as you say, it's kind of, it it explains a lot about the changing dynamics that, that, uh, that the rise of T20 has, has brought about because you have, you know, this fantastically talented group of players who they're they're almost like the, the kind of Avengers of, of 2020 cricket. They go scatter off to the winds and then they come back for major tournaments and, um, and you remember how good they all are together. Yeah, so the amazing thing about the West Indies in T Twenty cricket is they they're often very very weak in bilateral T Twenty cricket because they tend not to have their their full strength team, 
But when it comes to the World Cup and T20, and there's no other T20 cricket, you know, that's when they get their, their full strength team and they're phenomenally successful. And part of the reason they are so successful is because they, they play more of it than anyone else. Um, so I think from 2012 to 16, the period when they won two World Cups and reached the semi-final in the other, the six players in the world to play the most T20 matches were all from West Indies. So, you, you know, they're getting this amazing experience in T20 leagues around the world, in in India, in uh, in Australia, in, in Pakistan, in England, even a little bit. And the Caribbean itself has a good league and they, they're, they're bringing that to bear in the international game. And, and the styles of... West Indies cricket that worked particularly well in T20, certainly um, the emphasis on, on six hitting, which we see um, that probably stems from wind ball cricket in Trinidad and Tobago, especially, which is played generally with a, a plastic ball. So it, it, a lighter ball, probably eight a side match in 10 or 12 overs. And what this engenders is the ability to hit sixes for batsmen and for bowlers, the sort of the savvy to stop them hitting sixes. You know, um, and that means that whereas most players in T20 they struggle because the game is so much shorter than 50 overs on the formats that they're used to. So we see batsmen coming overvalue their wickets. They're, they're, they're too defensive. They almost can't train themselves out of the the old traditional cr- thinking in, in cricket. West Indies, because of this grounding often in, in wind ball cricket, that, that's the perfect grounding for T20 cricket. So they, they don't overvalue their, their, their wickets. Um, they have a bit hit sixes. They, and they produce these fantastic bowlers, you know, such as, you know, Sunil Ryan, Samuel Badgeri, who have, who learn the sort of subtle skills to, to stop to stop big hitters, um, so it comes together and, and yeah, turned out especially you know, one point five million people. You know, you can absolutely you can do a who's who of into royalty from Trinidad. You have um, Narayan Badgeri, Dwayne Bravo, Kieran Pollard, uh, Nicholas Peran now is looking like it could be the same. So you have yeah, fantastic array of, of, of talent from Trinidad especially and the West Indies, the, the way they play the game actually with not caring about dot balls, which is, you know, balls you don't score off because they know they can make up for it with, with sixes. Well, that um, that helps to redefine the game around the world. So they're not just a brilliant team, but they're a team that helps to change how the, the, the sport is played. And changing the, the balance as well between the power of the player and, and the board because... If you are able to play T Twenty cricket, you're able to make a living completely independently of uh, of the international game, so long as you've gained some profile uh, initially. And the balance between international cricket and um, and the franchise game, because as you mentioned, the Caribbean Premier League uh, is is relatively speaking one of one of the biggest leagues in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, clearly th- this this trend in. <laughs> These trends of both countries that was seem to be so good in T20 and have had a negative impact at times, certainly in, in Test cricket. I mean, the situation between players and the board must is much better than it was a few years ago. But, but I think, yeah, the economics being what they are, where players could earn you know far more for a T20 league for, for six weeks than they could be playing a year of international cricket. You know that the West Indies have been an extreme case study of the kind of the broader economic shifts in, in the sport and how they're, they're changing it. Okay, well, Cricket 2.0 Inside the T20 Re- Revolution is uh, out now from all good booksellers uh, and uh, and uh, available as ebook as well. I'm guessing, Tim. Yep, of course. Have you have you done have you done an audio book recording, you and Freddie? Or yeah, we we didn't do the recording, thank God. But um, <laughs> there was a recording done. Yeah, it's out. It's out in India as well uh, as well now. So, uh, but yeah, actually, bookshops of course the UK are opening again. So um, yeah. They are, and uh, everyone should. We haven't had an official confirmation of this yet, but everyone should have uh, uh, another few months at least to read that before the Men's World Cup, T20 World Cup, resumes in Australia. Well, Tim, thanks very much for uh, for all your time this morning. Uh, Thanks, Owen. Cheers. And uh, thanks again to Steve Alworthy, uh, and thanks to all of you for listening. We'll be back again very soon. Bye-bye. The Sports Pro Podcast is published by Sports Pro Media. The producer is Ed Dixon. 